So I'd like to welcome you all to the Brooklyn Museum. A woman's afterlife together. I was asked if I would like to do a program, and I said yes, and I definitely want to invite Kara Kirby to come and have a conversation with me about this subject. The exhibition is actually based on the research that Professor Kirby has worked on for several years, and she's, she's spoken in other places about it, but we are fortunate that she has agreed to a rather informal conversation about the whole range of a whole range of topics. The, this exhibition is at the Brooklyn Museum as part of the celebration of the tenth year of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. And um, when I was asked to do an Egyptian exhibition that would be part of that celebration, I immediately thought of Kara's articles on this subject. So without any further ado. So the question is, how how do you think that feminism has had an impact on Egyptology? So thank you, Ed. Thank you, Brooklyn Museum. Um, thanks for the invitation. It's nice to be in New York. And um, I didn't know this was going to be, because I don't read my emails. I read them too fast. Does anyone else do that? Yeah. So I read my emails too fast, and I didn't know this would be a discussion. He's like, oh, we sit down and have a discussion. I said, oh, that's so great. I love that. So we're sitting down and having a discussion, and he's asking me hard questions like, how does feminism have an impact on Egyptology? Which I could talk about for a long time, because I, um, I teach a class right now at UCLA. We just wrapped it up called Women in Power in the Ancient World. And we, I, one of my main points is, why did ancient Egypt, the most authoritarian and totalitarian regime, allow women into power systematically and regularly compared to other places like Persia, Greece, Rome, um, other places we could we could compare. Um, but Ed's question is about feminism in Egyptology, and there it gets a little more historiographic and complicated. But Ed knows with whom I studied at Johns Hopkins, and that would be Betsy Bryant, who is I would say, and you can disagree with me, one of the first real feminists. Egyptologist who attacked women's studies in a from a more feminist perspective. Right now, I, I, I always, whenever I end up talking about this question, which I do sometimes in class when I talk about Hutchinson, I always think of Betsy Bryant because she was my classmate at a time in, uh, in, in Egyptology at a time when all of the faculty members were men, and it was unusual that a although there must have been many young women who wanted to be Egyptologists. In the meantime, women have taken over the field. Sure. Well, come, come close. <laughs> not, not in philological circles, which is interesting, and we could discuss that. Um, philology seems to attract more men in general than it does women, but Egyptian art and architecture and archaeology have really been taken over by the females. Um, and there's discussion there as well. So, so last time when I was thinking about this discussion, I figured out that about a third to a half of the faculty members in Egyptology in this country now are women. Yeah. That's a third to a half. That's a hundred percent more than there were back in the days when I was a student. Um, and now we see them. Is it going to be even more women involved? And, and I know, um, and core faculty at the Coatesian Institute of Archaeology at UCLA, and there are so many female students, graduate students, that when we have a male apply, the director of the program says, oh, well, that's a diversity. <laughs> we should consider this student, and in many ways he's right um, when he says that. So the feminism in Egyptology is a strange thing because the women have very much or are moving and encroaching to take over the field. And so questions of 
women in ancient Egypt, um, the female, I think, are on the forefront. People are discussing it. What I think is um, is often missing, and I and I see this not just in Egyptology but in ancient studies uh, around the globe, is that when people discuss women, they they do a very encyclopedic, descriptive sort of discussion of this is. This is, these are the powers that women had. They could get divorced. They could have property, or they couldn't. They had to veil, or they didn't have to. And, and there's this discussion of a woman's place with the assumption, well, they don't even say that patriarchy is the order of the day. And then there's often this revisionist tone that I think has been there since the 60s and it is only sort of changing, where we look for the women who had power and highlight them in a way to make ourselves feel better about women not having power without asking the question more systematically of why are women excluded from power so regularly and what are the mechanisms in place. So when I bring feminism to Egyptology now, it is with a clear eye towards the patriarchal system and looking at the women who transcended it and then looking at the pushback that took place after those women transcended it. Um, that's for political power. I do the same thing for religious studies. I'll do the same thing for what you have in the exhibition for funerary arts and how um, women are represented there as well. But it's it's a giant topic, and I only think it's just started. So could you talk? I know you've written a book about Hatshepsut. Would you like to talk about Hatshepsut as an example of one of these case studies that are so popular now? Yeah, so I wrote a book called uh, uh, The Woman Who Would Be King. Sorry, I get confused because I'm working on another book now called When Women Rule the World. Oh, look, he's got it right there. That's awesome. So the woman who would be king, and I wanted to write it in a very different way. The standard ancient Egyptian biography, or the Egyptological biography, there are no ancient Egyptian biographies, uh, really, is um, very descriptive. This is what we know, often told from the perspective of the male discoverer. So if you pick up a Joyce Tilsley book on Tutankhamen, and it'll be about how Howard Carter discovered Tutankhamen, and then you'll feed into information about the life of that king. For the Hatshepsut book, I wanted to make it a study from cradle to grave with her circumstances, her life story, her decision-making process, maybe even her emotions, her losses, as far as I felt I could go. And in the beginning, I'm very clear I'm actually quite defensive, I've been told in the beginning, about how much uh, I'm going to invent and how much I'm going to create in some ways out of whole cloth. I'm clear when I do it, but I wanted to write it with as much of her humanity in mind, because if the Egyptians excel at anything, they excel at perfecting these people and in many ways taking their humanity away. And so my purpose, I thought, was to try to find the humanity behind all of that perfection. And you know, it was Gay Robbins at a dinner after she had read the book. She goes, No, Karen, it's interesting. We know so little about that. I didn't realize that until I read your book. <laughs> it's very nice. Um, but we know so little about the decision making process or what is she stealing it? Is she saving it? What her what her intention was, what her agenda was. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna get the characters, the circumstances, the place, the politics, and try to come up with the most likely solution for what it was that, that she was doing. And to get to the feminist part of the question and, and put that out there, for Hatshepsut, everyone knows the name Cleopatra, right? And how did she end? Suicide after the Battle of Actium, brutal end. And we all remember her in Shakespeare writes plays about her. We all know the names of other such women like uh, Semiramis. Sex woman who has sex with a man and then has him killed the next day because 
Likely Hatshepsut, ruled for a longer period of time, saved her dynasty, her father's dynasty, brought up a king probably from the age of two, made sure they lived to be king, set him up to be the Napoleon of Egypt and made Egypt's empire the largest it had ever been. She did everything right. And what does she get? She's just forgotten. Just swept aside. And so the, the, the feminist perspective of Hatshepsut, I think, is, um, is there. And that's, that's why I'm writing the next book. I have more to say, apparently. Um, so the next, and I didn't plan on doing this. I was going to write a book on Akhenaten called The First Fanatic, which is interesting to me in, in light of modern day politics, yes. Um, and this idea that fanaticism could have come from ancient Egypt, that that's the, the source for this way of thinking about God and religion and fighting for God and all of this. I was all ready to jump into probably the deepest, most impenetrable, blackest waters that an Egyptologist can jump into. It's rather stupid. And as I was shopping the book around, people were like, you know, really, can you write something else about women? I'm like, oh, I don't want to be the Egyptologist that's always writing stuff about women. But it seems to be what people want. So now I'm writing, and, and, and I have more to say. So now I'm writing the next book, which is called When Women Rule the World, which is specifically about hostility towards females in power. And I think that I couldn't have written it if we hadn't all gone through the last election to see that no of wrongdoing by a woman is that much more powerful than the absolute facts of wrongdoing by a man. That, whatever you think of Clinton's politics, that fact remains that she is judged much more harshly um, by her baggage than somebody like Trump is for his. And the gender, sexuality aspects are very, very interesting to me. And what better way to write about American politics than through the lens of ancient Egypt? And <laughs> to talk about six queens, some of whom became kings, power at the highest level, what happened to them, what the pushback was, why we are, and I touch on this in my class, Women Empowering the Ancient World at UCLA, why we human beings are inherently, I dare say, even biologically opposed to female power in ways that we don't talk about, we don't discuss, we just react to. And as with um, racism and a black baby wanting to look at black skin color, in a psychological study or a white baby wanting to look at white skin color more in a psychological study. These things are biologically true and we are attracted to what is like us. But these things, if we talk about them and deal with them, can be transcended. And I remember saying in one lecture that it makes sense to me that a black man could become president before a woman. Because we can talk about race and we can see it in a more clear way. And also, racism, if the sources of racism in this country Yes, there are many, but if the original horror source is chattel slavery of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, the horror source of feminist or anti-female hostility is constant every time somebody gets pregnant, every time somebody gets raped, every time somebody has a baby, every time somebody needs a, a birthing um, plan, every time somebody needs to breastfeed somewhere people are uncomfortable with. It is a constant um, inequality. It is so hard to overcome because it is always biologically there. And until we actually deal with this in a more open, verbal community discussion, um, the better. Anyone notice how quickly we dropped the feminist discussion as soon as Trump became president? Yes, we had more to worry about. But damn, did we drop that like a hot potato. No need to talk about that anymore. And now we just say, oh, yeah, no reason. Oh, I would love to talk about that stuff. We could talk. Yeah, you know, bring it back to you. So, so, um, how did you come to the subject? Now, let's now make our segue into the next book we're discussing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how did you come to the subject of the the differences between female burials and male burials in ancient Egypt? You know what? I don't know how I came to it originally. I'm trying to think. I mean, the fact that I was working with 19th and 20th dynasty coffins, um, and you and I just discussed this in, in, a, in a way that makes it an, a reaction to certain religious events, which is really interesting. But I was working with the time period, 19th dynasty around 1300, 1250 BCE, which is very unusual in its depictions of, of coffins. And let me show you. It's a very unusual thing to have the gender of either the female or the male expressed in a coffin. The norm is to show the deceased like this, 
Okay, this is a woman, though you would hardly know it, right? There are breasts there, but they're modeled very subtly in a way that you can't see. And there are certain times in history when the Egyptians decided they wanted to be more upfront about the sexuality of the person on the inside of that coffin than in others. And the Ramesses period was one such time when they were very upfront about it. All of a sudden, they have these fabulous wigs, they have earrings, the breasts are there, and that body in white on the inside shows the undulations of the female form in a way that is new and striking and very unusual. And it made me think, huh, what's, what's going on with this? Because, of course, the deceased in this coffin is still called Osiris, E.E. Nefertiti. She's not Hathor, E.E. Nefertiti. She can't be. She's Osiris, E.E. Nefertiti. She has to become the masculine entity to be reborn because of the, the means of rebirth or creation in ancient Egypt, which we can discuss. Um, so this idea that the ancient Egyptian female had a problem in getting to the next life, I found very intriguing. And the same social... Could, could you yeah, explain yeah. what the problem was? So, so oh, let's have? go back to our, our original problem. And I'll, I'll try to put up a less sexy slide. There are a lot of sexy slides here. <laughs> um, this one's less sexy. Um, the ancient Egyptians understood creation as not you work for six days and then you rest and it's done. It was an ongoing, constant thing, such that every temple that was built, every offering that was given, everything that the priests did was there to make creation happen again. The Egyptians, in a sense, believed that, that, that offerings needed to take place or that creation, actual creation, needed to happen for the sun to rise and set every day, for the Nile to flood every year. So creation was an ongoing thing. I'll show one sexy slide. Such that the first monumental statue in all of human history is a god masturbating, a male god masturbating, because the creation of the world was essentially a sexual big bang of a god having sex with himself. I, you can imagine teaching this at UCLA. It's a great <laughs> fun, right? It wakes up the undergrads. They love that. And, um, and But nothing embarrasses them more than discussion like this, which is, of course, fun. I revel in it. But anyway, so the females got a problem, yes? This is not just for the creation of the world. This was believed to be the recreation of the sun god every day. He's thought to be swallowed by his mother, Newt, the sun god, and he, he impregnates her with his future self. That's the way it is described in many texts, the way it's understood. And Osiris's rebirth, and we could get a lot more explicit than this, and Egyptians certainly did. If you go to Denver, you like a whole cartoon scene of Osiris laying there dead, and then a part of Osiris is ready to go, and his hand reaches out, and then he rises up. The Egyptians were not shy about showing how this creation, recreation after death in this case, happened. And so you have a real problem when it comes to the female. She can call herself Osiris, but she doesn't have the necessary equipment. You would think that wasn't a problem, but Tutankhamun's body has a mummified penis, doesn't it, in the erect position. Um, obviously, everybody has a mummified penis. So you would think, how are, how are females going to deal with this conundrum? And um, there, there are issues. Um, yeah, is that, is, that, is that the answer? Yes. So, yeah. so how, how, did, how did women deal with the fact that, that fertility, uh, recreation, is really mas a masculine activity? And yet a woman needs to be reborn in, in her coffin. She's isolated inside her coffin after her death, and she needs to be reborn into the next world. So how, how did women deal with that? For well, there are many and with no masculine uh, principle nearby. Well, it's, as you and I have discussed, it's more complicated than just the feminine needing the masculine. The masculine, it seems, also needs the feminine. And if you like, the coffin itself is a feminine element. It's a feminine word. It ends in a T. Ancient Egyptian was just like the smurf, smurf and smurfette. So you add a T and you feminize something. Um, the ancient Egyptian coffin was a, a hoot or a wet. And in a way, by placing the body inside of that coffin, you are, you are combining the masculine and the feminine elements in one piece. Anyone here been to a Hindu temple and seen the, the lingam stone, the, the phallic stone put into the the whole, in a way, you can see the mummy placed into the coffin in that same sexual way. So the female, uh, she has to androgenize, she has to, in a sense, masculinize 
in her mummy form and become as Osiris-like as she possibly can. And I don't have an image of it here, but there are extraordinarily well-preserved mummies from the royal branch of Daryl Bakri that had inlaid glass eyes, fake hair. They would actually stuff under the skin this fatty sawdust to make the, the face um, appear alive and more lifelike. And they did all of this work to male and female mummies. They added hair for the females, not for the males. But they did not fill out the breasts of the females. They left them flat. They left them flat. And I look at that and I think, oh, because she has to be Osiris. She can't just, she can't bring in so much of her femininity into the next life. But then you have a coffin like this that fragments it and brings in part so that the outer piece there, is a vehicle, an Osirian vehicle, I think. And the inner piece is the end result. The inner piece is what she is meant to become. And in typical Egyptian fashion, they put all of the stages there in one coffin set. It is a fait accompli. Your rebirth is a given. This is the way it's going to happen. All of these objects are making this so in material, magical form. But the, her, her super feminine self with all the emulations of her idealized and youthful so, I mean, she died older than this woman, and he never did. Um, it's inside of the Osirian um, crossed arms with all of the solar imagery on the outer piece that is more androgenizing, but not completely. And the Egyptians come up with multiple means of dealing with this, so that this is a 19th dynasty means of dealing with it. The 18th dynasty means before that was to have more of an androgenizing piece. And then as you go into the 21st dynasty, sorry as I skip ahead, um, actually let me do this piece. As you go to the 20th and 21st, there is a move away from showing the female form and the femininity on the inside. And this piece has been reused. So if you see the decoration on the bottom and then decoration on the top, they've just plastered over it. You see the lines on the bottom there? So that's the garment of a male or female, could be either one, wearing the white garment as the end result of what they were going to be after their transformation, through an Osirian transformation. Fashion dictated, or religious beliefs dictated, or for whatever reason, that there be a more Osirian understanding of this, and they cover over that imagery. It's only fashionable for a short period of time to show the female um, as clearly. Most of the time, this is something that Egyptians shy away from. It's weird they did it in the 19th dynasty. One of the things I, I like to point out in, in our version, our coffin, that, that shows this process is the way skin, t skin tone is used. And I, I, I often say that our, our coffin, where it walks, it has man's skin, even though she's a woman. Could you, yeah. could you talk about that? So if I look at, oh, sorry, this piece here, it is typical for, in, in on Egyptian stature, and there's much discussion about this by Egyptologists as well, there should be. But it is typical for Egyptian statues to show a male with a dark red over skin and to show a female with a yellow over skin. And there's a discussion about the elite woman staying in the home and thus not being out in the fields or not being an active member of society, more passive, and thus her skin color is lighter. And we could discuss all of those other things. But in the 19th dynasty, strangely, and I think coming from the top down, because Nefertari's tomb has it in the Valley of the Queens, but not everywhere. Somewhere she has light skin, somewhere she has dark skin. But in the 19th dynasty, you see the female represented with a dark red skin for the first time. This is a very masculinizing element. Strange to show a female with this skin color. Very, very unusual. And they don't hold back. This is a very dark skin color. And it's, she has that dark red on both the piece where she's shown with her white-dressed femininity and on the outer, more Syrian piece as well. And so... You wonder, is this a way of masculinizing a feminine object? I, I don't think we fully understand this. The Egyptians never created cheat sheets. We're like, we're doing this because of that, we're doing that because of this. Yeah, we wouldn't have a job. We wouldn't. Um, and all of this material, it is meant to be mysterious. It is meant to be something inevitable that you can't understand. It is also meant to be exclusionary. This is not a culture that decided, you know, we really want an alphabet, because we want everybody in society to be involved in our government. No, this is not that place. This is a place that kept a very archaic language system that is extraordinarily difficult to learn for thousands of years beyond the time when it was useful. And everyone talks about how unuseful it is, and they have more science, don't they, rather than less. This is a place that understands how to maintain exclusivity, social exclusivity. And these coffins never forget. They're for the top 3, 4, 5% of society. We're also horrible demographics, so how do you 
could say the 2%, that's what we like to say, right? Egypt is very much ruled by the 2%. These people are lower elites at the bottom of that, these particular coffins. Um, other coffins that I've shown you are much um, higher level, like maybe a piece like this. But um, these are people that are able to buy, to commission and buy expensive, well-crafted pieces that they're going to display for a short period of time and then bury in a hole in the ground, ostensibly for forever, until an archaeologist digs it up and finds it. But that's an extremely wasteful thing, and it speaks again to the social exclusivity that we're talking about. Most ancient Egyptians would have had a different understanding of funeral transformation of their next life, and can we even talk about that? Without them having written something down, it's very difficult. You can't get a cognitive archaeology discussion. And Egyptologists have been so overwhelmed with treasures like this that when you find a bunch of bodies without material culture in an intact tomb, they are usually ignored and not well photographed or discussed. It is a rare thing to find a bunch of poor people there, and they're very, even in the 19th, 20th, 21st dynasty, in the fetal position, facing the rising sun, without much burial materiality except for palm rib mats and other very simple things, maybe a comb or something, maybe some pots. That's it. It's, it's very hard to talk about the, the... In other words, <laughs> this is a problem for the rich, the lean woman, and not necessarily a problem for the other women, or we don't know. We don't know how they understood rebirth in the next life and if that fetal position was appropriate and okay. Could you talk a little bit about the... I know, the, the very first time I heard you talk, you were still a graduate student. <laughs> And, and you talked about the economics of coffins. Yeah. I think people, um, it was it was such a great paper that I sat there as a, I was actually an assistant professor by that point, and I thought to myself, I wish I had written this paper. <laughs> so, was it Michigan? No, it was in, I don't remember where we were. It could have been in Michigan. Um, okay. But at any rate, you, you were really one of the first people to talk about how much did these things cost. And could, so could you give a little idea of, of of those issues, yeah. what the issues are there and how you figured that out. Well, I like to, Egyptologists talk about coffins all the time, right? All the time. What do they talk about? This is an image of this God. This is an image of that God. This is Book of the Dead, Chapter 151. This is Chapter 161. This is the way it works. And we get lost in the weeds. Not that there is nothing useful there, but I teach a graduate seminar at UCLA that deals with the decorative program in the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the and I tell them on the first day, okay, everyone's going to be picking up a, a book of the underworld. Everyone's going to be picking a tomb. And each of you is going to feel the desire to totally get lost in the weeds and start to argue with each other about what underworld divinity this is. And you see other, the similar underworld divinities here. What are they doing and how does it work? And if we do that, then we fall into the trap that the, the ideology sets for us, that it can be neither proven nor disproven, but also that it is a tool of social power. So let's just wipe all of that aside. Yes, the coffin is a religious object par excellence. Yes, it's there to transform the dead into a living person, into an Osiris, and then into a, a blessed divine person. But the idea that these are commodities that were bought and sold that had a price, and that these prices could vary from piece to piece, was really interesting to me. So I wrote a book called The Cost of Death. That was my first book. And um, my dissertation. And I looked at a number of prices that, that had already been wonderfully collected for me by a number of um, Czech and Dutch scholars in, in very useful ways. And I was able to collect all of these prices, and then I just started to, to work with those prices, trying to understand how much different pieces might have cost and how much people would pay for certain things, what kinds of things they were interested in. And this work still is interesting to me in terms of um, display potential. So if you see a set like, oh, like this, most of the really expensive stuff, the gold, the inlay, the piece that has the most careful work on it, the piece that would have been, that would have cost more, is the innermost piece in the center right there. So that mask right there. 
gilding is a very expensive piece. The outer coffin doesn't even have gilding, that big outermost piece. And no one had looked at coffins this way in terms of where is the expensive stuff. And if you look at coffins this way in terms of where is the expensive stuff, then you're also able to understand where is the focus of the ritual and how does the ritual work. And then you start to realize that the reasons people are making decisions about coffins or uh, coffin style choice, why a fashion might move in one direction or another, is not necessarily from on high, from a religious high priest telling you it should be this way or that way, but because people want to display something in one way or another. And the ritual, the display potential demands it. Um, it's, it, I always, well, let me put it this way. I grew up in a very socially competitive place in Houston, Texas. Anybody here from Houston, Texas? Houston? No? Okay, good. Um, and and I, I saw people displaying with extraordinary objects like watches or boots or eyeliner or Hello Kitty markers or whatever from my youngest years. I remember the teacher's parking lot was all normal Honda Civics and the student's parking lot was full of Porsches and other things. I did not have a Porsche, I might add. Um, and I also did not spend $10,000 on my sorority portfolio, but I know many girls who did such things and now it's even more of whatever. So I grew up in a setting where, where people use their material objects to gain power of and when I became, when I was in my 20s, I started to look at weddings in a, in a similar way. What does the bride's dress look like? You can tell a lot about ethnicity, about socioeconomic status, about whether you're first or second generation. All kinds of religious notions by the dress of the bride as she's walking down the aisle. So I thought, why couldn't I do this for coffins as well? So I look at the coffin as a means of expressing um, social power and social display, which is very un-Egyptological. Egyptologists usually look at these objects as transformation pieces and transformation pieces only from a religious perspective. And I look at them as objects that display family power and wealth that needed to be displayed. And the display for me is the most important part of it. That's why people put so much wealth into these pieces. It's the short-term display that is what people are commissioning these pieces for, not the long-term ownership. I'm not saying the long-term ownership isn't important, but the short-term display is essential. And so for elite men or women, those um, these pieces are a calling card to their entire family. And if the dead do not bury themselves, and of course they don't, then it's about the, the social place of, of a family at any, at any given time. But do you want to know more about prices or, or anything well, like that? that actually, or, well, you could just say a few words, perhaps, about specific prices, and then I was hoping you would you would talk about a related issue, which you've worked on, which is the reuse of coffins mm -hmm. as the, as coffins get more expensive. Um, because the coffin in the exhibition is actually one that was reused at, re reused at least once. Yes. Uh, and uh, over several generations. Um, now, the, I mean, prices, I don't want to bore you too much. Um, but it, in comparison to, to um, the amount of labor a person would need to yeah. do um, in order to earn, a, have a, earn enough to have a coffin. And you know what? The reuse. So let me start with the second part because that's actually changed a lot of my ideas. I feel like I have to rewrite a lot of my ideas about the, the value of coffins. I said in my first book, The Cost of Death, that I was amazed at how little the material cost for these coffins talking about 20% of the entire cost went for wood, and most of the value was in labor, which I found very surprising. I now am understanding that the prices I was looking at were 20th dynasty prices, when reuse was happening like crazy. And so there's a reason that material price is so low, because they're reusing all of these coffins. And the wood is old wood. It's um, 19th dynasty or 18th dynasty wood that's being, um, that's being reused. So maybe we could s step back and just give a basic explanation of what you mean by reuse. And I'm trying to think of which side that reused piece was. Very few of the pieces I'm showing here are reused. So it isn't reused, not reused. It's 22nd, so no. 
This is the, so right now the only piece I have that's reused potentially is this one here. And it's the earliest evidence of reuse that I've got, so, so it's okay. Um, this is a piece in the British Museum, and I think you can see the reuse pretty clearly. It's an extraordinary thing to think about taking the body of an ancestor out of a coffin, placing that body over to the side, bringing that coffin out of the tomb, redecorating it, recommodifying that coffin essentially, reselling it or reusing it within the context of the family, and then putting a new body inside of it. And when I bring this idea up to people, the first question that's, that's raised, particularly in Egypt where people are very sensitive about, about this, is how dare you say that these coffins are reused? That's an extraordinarily immoral thing to do. And I say, how is it? It's the most moral solution in a time period of crisis and economic scarcity. So we can all imagine that we live in a time period of economic scarcity and a very fiercely loved, loved one in your family has died. And you're an Egyptian. You believe that you need this materiality to transform the dead into an Osiris. This needs to happen in your mind. And are you just going to let your mother not be transformed? Or are you going to go into the family vault, go into the burial chamber, move some pieces around, find a coffin set belonging to an ancestor that you don't know or remember anymore? Your family doesn't even talk about that ancestor. You, you, you move some things around, you take the coffin set out, you open it up, you see the ancestor, and then it kind of hits you, oh dear. You believe in, in the angry dead. You believe that these dead people could come back and, and harm you in some way. You might then bring in a magician or a priest or somebody who can make sure that the dead is going to not um, turn against you. And there are some really, the inscription for Nessie Kantz, have you read it um, recently? It's a 21st Dynasty text where it keeps encircling her heart, encircling her heart, saying that no harm will come to anybody from Nessie Kansu, that she will not harm this person, she will not harm that person, Nessie Kansu will not harm anybody. People have, like Robert Rittner or any other Egyptologist have looked at this text and said, wow, this Nessie Kansu woman must have been quite a horrible woman <laughs> because they're all terrified that Nessie Kansu is going to come out of her grave and just ah, attack them, and they're all freaked out so much so they go to the priesthood in, in Karnak and say, please, you know, write up this, this text for us and do this magical spell. I looked at that and I went, oh my God, it's a magical spell to make sure that when they're reusing her coffins, that she, her ghost doesn't come and bite them when, when they've done this. So they bring somebody in to encircle her heart, make sure that she's not harming anyone, and then they move her aside in the burial chamber. It's why the only 19th Dynasty burial chamber... Um, uh, so Ramesid burial chamber that was found intact had only nine bodies buried in coffins and another 11 or 12, I don't have to look at the exact numbers, were found outside of coffins. I used to understand that was because the poor people wanted to be buried with the rich people, right? The poor cousin who couldn't afford a coffin put the mummy in and then the other people who have a nice coffins, they would all be there together. No, 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 no. Everyone that went into this burial chamber had a coffin originally but they were taken out of those coffins as the 20th dynasty went on. Um, so you, so your mother's died, right? We're going with our hypothetical idea of somebody you fiercely love has, has just died, and this is the only moral solution. You remove an ancestor whom you don't really remember. You treat that ancestor with respect. You move the body over. Keep it in your burial chamber in a protected space. Yes, without a bodily container, but you keep it there. And then you bring that coffin out and you update it. It's important to update these pieces if possible. At the very least, you must update with the name and title of the new person, which is all your coffin of where it walks at, or Ben Suipit has, right? Ben Suipit is the reuser, right. and where it walks at was the original owner. And this coffin amazes me, your, the coffin in the, in the exhibition here, because when that piece was displayed in the funeral, everyone would have known it was reused. Everyone would have known it was an old piece. It's, it's not like getting married in a vintage wedding gown, guys. This is not something you want to show off to people. The norm for reuse was to hide your tracks, to plaster over the old decoration as we see here, and put a new decoration on the surface. This is why reuse was not seen for so long, and I'm the first person to look at it systematically because I'm crazily obsessed with coffins, and that's not something that everybody should do. It's a weird thing. But... 
But so the the idea that this is immoral, I, I push back against. This is the only moral way of dealing with it. But the Egyptians themselves knew there was a problem with it, which is why they tried to cover their tracks more often than not. And when they reused, they updated and tried to make it modern and stylish. This piece here is a reused set, but I can't show you where it is without any close-up pictures of the cracks to give you an idea of where the old decoration would be. But I've been looking at coffins dating to the 21st dynasty, time period during and after the Bronze Age collapse, a time period of extraordinary crisis in the ancient world when the sea peoples are sweeping around the Mediterranean and kingdoms are falling in their wake and people don't have enough to eat and there is warfare everywhere. Down south in Egypt, in Thebes, people are able to hold on a little bit better, but they still have no wood and cultivation in the Delta because the Delta has been laid waste from all we can tell. And they don't have wood coming in from the Lebanon and trade because that trade has been shut down and we have other pieces of evidence to make that point for us for the 21st dynasty. And people are driven by the lack of wood in particular to take old wooden coffins, scrape that decoration down and start again. And I've been looking, I've looked at probably 300 coffins of the 21st dynasty with my own eyes, sometimes through museum cases, sometimes not, trying to determine if a piece was reused or not. And my numbers right now, do you know what my percentage is? Can you guess? I know it's higher than it was. It's 65% with just what I can see with my two eyes. And I know that if I was able to use my super x-ray vision for all of these pieces, some sort of stealth um, means of looking through plaster, I would see much more than that. But um, 65%, it's, it's not too bad. So the reuse is, it, to me, it again makes the point that the Egyptians, when they had to choose, were more interested in the short-term use of these objects and display than they were in the long-term ownership. And there are even coffins that I, I could show you in a different PowerPoint that have um, a blank that is varnished over for the name, which I think approaches a kind of coffin rental if you like. Because you can write over a varnished surface and you can easily wipe that away with a wet cloth. Um, I call it the wipey board hypothesis. And, um, and I'm working with, with a conservator to help me determine if, you know, how, how that would work if you applied varnish to a surface, how you could apply ink to it, how you might be able to wipe it off and, and reapply. But, um, so yeah. The, the, my, my final issue that I wanted to be sure we covered before we open the floor up to questions has to do with the, the use of language and with where it walks its coffin in particular, there is the issue that masculine language is used to address the deceased yeah. even though she's a woman. So I, I wanted to ask you to talk about that. Yeah, this is, this is a really cool um, feature of ancient Egyptian coffins that, or, or funerary objects where you see different pronouns being used. So on this scarab, you see um, the name and title of the deceased. In this case, it's Nub Iti. And it's um, the Osiris Nub Iti. She says, to introduce the Book of the Dead text that goes along with the scarab, which is about the heart of my mother, heart of my mother, and it goes on. Later on in this Book of the Dead text, the pronoun his is used. And Egyptologi the Egyptologist who published this said that it was a stock piece that was purchased on the market, and then they just changed the pronoun because this was the way things worked. And I, and I thought, okay, I'm not sure, because on a coffin, like this piece here in the British Museum, fully gilded set, cedar wood, 19th dynasty, highest quality of the highest elite you can possibly imagine. The fact that this came to the museum in, in one set is extraordinary in and of itself. And if you look at... Here we've got her name. She's the Osiris. Do you see the Osiris there? The eye and the seat and the guy? That's the name of the god Osiris. And then you have Nebet Pear. I can barely, there's the pear. And then she's Shemait en Amen. So she's the mistress of uh, the um, chantress of Amen. And then her name, and I can barely see that, Henut Mehit is here. Then do you see the snake, the cobra? Jed S. She says. Very clearly, they understand she's a woman, she's got female titles, no problem. But if you look at the Book of the Dead 151 on the case sides and in other parts, he, his, she's masculinized. The people who made this were amazingly skilled craftsmen. 
The people who ordered it were very rich, discerning, rich people. Do you know any discerning rich people around? Right? The kind who can look at a really nice Armani suit and go, oh, yes, that's, you know, that was from last collection. I am not that person, but we all know those people, right? And the discerning rich people who can read hieroglyphs are going to know whether there's a he in there, and they're not going to think of it as a scribal mistake. And it's a facile way of going about this. This was purposefully done. She's able to have her cake and eat it, too. She's able to be masculine and feminine simultaneously. And they do it in very clever ways. So she is feminine when her identity is introduced, her herself, the title, mistress of the house, chantress of Amun, Henut Mahit, she says. But then in all of the text, it talks about making sure her corpse is intact and making sure that her Osirian body parts are put together in an Osirian way. She is he. He does his body, his this or that, purposefully done. And so that's, that's where the language element comes in. But that also stresses to you guys how much of an elite and intellectual problem this was, that in many ways the Egyptian rich created for themselves when they started to bury their dead in anthropoid Osirian-like coffins in the first place. And before that point, when they were just buried in boxes, this wasn't even an issue. The problem gets worse for the female the more tricked out their, their coffins get. So, um, I, I would think this would be a good point to start taking questions yeah. from the floor. And, Kara, I'm going to ask you to call on people because yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sure. having vision problems right now, and I'm not sure yeah, I'll be no, able to see his hands up. Czech and Dutch. And the reason I say Czech and Dutch is because Yaroslav Cherny who is a god of Egyptian heretic texts, of, of non-fiction um, heretic texts, uh, went around the world whenever there was an ostracon or a, a set of ostraca that he could transcribe, he did. And his notebooks then made their way into the Griffith Institute in London. And, um, and sorry, what? Oxford. Oh, sorry, Oxford. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in Oxford. And um, when I was doing my dissertation research, the Griffith Institute was closed and I couldn't get in, but at Leiden University, at the NINO, and I'm not going to try to translate, but it's the Near Eastern Studies Department in, in Leiden, they have, um, they have Xerox copies of the entire uh, notebook from Czerny. So I went to Leiden instead, and Leiden is also a bastion of these um, non-literary heretic texts. And they've added to it as well. And there's a wonderful Egyptologist who recently died named Yak Janssen, who wrote a book that sounds, it's got the sexiest title, you guys, you're not going to believe it, called Commodity Prices from the Ramesid Period, a book you and I both know well. It is a great book. It sounds horrible, but it is amazing what this guy did. And um, Yak Janssen collected prices for different kinds of wooden objects, coffins, shirts, sandals, livestock of all kinds, food of all kinds. It's a discussion of vocabulary as much as anything else, trying to figure out what's what. And the section on coffins I found rather intriguing. He was pretty, he got almost every piece. I found a couple of prices that he didn't include in there. But for the most part, he was able to um, find every piece where Yak and I disagreed. And Yak, Yak said, did you know this? When I was writing my dissertation, I wrote him a letter saying, this is my dissertation, that's what I'm working on. And he wrote me a handwritten 10-page letter saying, this is a horrible idea. And why it was a horrible idea. But I can imagine it. But that I was making assumptions that the Egyptians had a market economy and understood profit and that that was stupid and that the Egyptians had a primitive economy and this was the way it worked. And, um, and I didn't know how to react to that. But then I, at the, you know, when you're a grad student, you don't have the confidence that you, you have later. You think that you're an idiot. And when somebody like Yak Janssen writes you a 10-page letter saying that you suck, you're like, oh, my God, you suck. And so... I remember going in tears to my advisor and saying, what do I do? What do I do? They're like, you just rework the economy, stupid. And I went, oh, okay. And so then I, I became involved in discussions of ancient economy. And it's, uh, yeah, the Egyptians had an understanding of profit. Yes, they knew how to buy and sell. Yes, they knew what the value of these things were. And yes, value did go up in time depending on the scarcity or the plentiful nature of the commodity in question. Um, and the reason prices for things like sandals or shirts change so little 
is because in an agricultural economy, the price for flax or the price for leather and the labor there too change so little, it doesn't mean that there's no inflation. There's grain inflation to be seen in the Egyptian text, but so we had an economic disagreement. But does that, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So these texts all come from ancient Thebes, and most of these texts come from the Theban Western Desert. Many of them come from a site called Dir al Medina, where the workmen uh, who decorated the tombs in the Valley of the Kings lived. And many of them come from the Valley of the Kings or Queens itself. Um, and the reason they survive, and essentially they're potsherds or limestone flakes with black or red ink written on them. The only reason they survive is because they weren't deposited near the inundation areas. So objects like this would have been made, little notes like a laundry list. You send your laundry out, or I'm going to buy this cow, and it's going to cost me 60 debit, and you make a little list of it. You might put it in ink on a potsherd, but if you live in the delta, and you throw that away, archaeologists who find it go, look, a potsherd. You find that in the desert, in the Theban desert, you find it, you're like, oh my God, there's a text on here. And then you can work with it in a different way because of the arid climate. And I'm sorry I skipped over the sources of that. Um, yes, please. the top three, four, five percent, and notice how I just did that. We know so little about the people who are in control of this Egyptian society that I don't know if it would really be three percent, five percent, or what. Um, but the people at the bottom of this elite social status emulated the people at the top. So the people at the top would have, any of you guys been to the Met recently? And seeing Mekhet Aten, the beautiful image of the female, all of those figurines from the Middle Kingdom tomb, and she's got the thing on her head with the bread and beer, and she's bringing these these things in for the dead. That's what, and I think I might actually have that in this um, discussion. But she's the, yeah, okay. So Mekhet Aten is the most beautiful example. And then there's something like this, which doesn't suck, but it ain't that Mekhet Aten piece, is it, right? And you can see the difference in quality. This is something that, uh, from a, an anthropological perspective, I have been advised to not talk about, that there are no quality differences, that they have different um, feelings to them, or they, but they have the same function. I agree, yes, they have the same function, but in terms of display, the discerning high-level elites would look at something like this and say, yeah, I mean, how cute, you, yes, it's going to function for you, but they will just overlook it and not even notice. It's like a gap sweater for them, right? Who cares? But that Mekhet Aten piece, that will be talked about, it will be discussed, people will remember it, and that is a way of making your case amongst other elites. Um, can I really make any sorts of discussion in terms of numbers and give you a sociological analysis of this? Not with what we have, not really. Um, I could show you some way uglier examples of this. I have a photo of a piece that I saw in storage in Berlin at the Egyptisches Museum. And the, she looks like that girl. She's got like these weird eyes and her head is just a block, just stuck on there and the duck looks horrible. But it's got the duck, it's got the beard, it's got the woman and it's got breasts just kind of boom, right there. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're meant to be functional. But there are many different ways of, of communicating your worth. Think of the mask of Tut. You can all see it in your mind's eye right now. Drop dead gorgeous, amazing piece, solid gold, you know that's power. And then you see a gilded piece that's trying to approach that power. And then you see a coffin that is polychrome that is not even close, but they're trying to make their case amongst their display audience. So to kind of give a quick and dirty answer to your question at the end of that long thing, is to say that people are displaying to the people that make a difference in their social life. These people aren't going to display to the uber-rich. The uber-rich don't care about their tomb. They're not going to be there to see it. The uber-rich are only going to be looking at where they're looking. It's a much closer circle, tighter thing. Details will be focused on in a way that you don't with these pieces. And the lower elites are going to focus on making a bigger splash, taking their more limited resources and being more ostentatious with it and, and trying to make a, a bigger display because they have more people to impress. 
than the very, very rich. Does that kind of make a, a point? I, I, I would just add that that whole process then goes on in modern museums as well. Okay. So we have a storeroom full of things that are, are lesser quality things. Which we love. Which, you know, that's we. But, but the, the exhibition space, which is limited, we take the best things and put them on display for you. So that creates a kind of um, distorted picture of what ancient Egypt was like. Everybody I've ever met who is reincarnated from ancient Egypt, he was a king or a prince yes, or a queen. A I've never met a peasant who no. was reincarnated. I was a farmer. Yes. yes. Um, I'm going to do a graduate seminar this next year at UCLA on Egyptian social history, and I'm very excited about it because we, you know, we have the social history of ancient Egypt, but what the hell was that? And that needs to be redone. It's a beautiful book, but it's a confusing book written by four different authors, and nobody really knows what to make of it. That's the O'Connor, um, who else? O'Connor, Lloyd, um, Trigger. Trigger, yeah. But you and then, and then you. Please. back to his question, and I'm writing an article about this right now, about um, burial chambers and sarcophagi and coffins and where people would put their, their wealth, their limited wealth. Everyone has limited wealth. Even a king has limited wealth. You can't take all the gold in the world and put it in the tomb. Um, and, the, and it's always a question of audience. Who gets to get in there? So, and, and a question of how many people in your audience you want to impress. Let me give you two different... Examples now. First, and I don't have an image of it. Remember those those mummies that I just showed you with the inlaid eyes and the braided hair and the stuffed faces and all. They are amazing mummies. How many people do you think got to view those mummies? How were they displayed? You're not supposed to show a naked body. This is an Osirian thing. It's supposed to be protected and safe. Who are you displaying this to? Maybe ten people, twelve people. The people who had their bodies mummified like this were displaying it to a very small set in a closed and very competitive community of other high elites. They did not need to worry about impressing the people below. They needed to worry about impressing their peers in this competitive high priesthood of Amun. That mummification technique disappears when society broadens and they need to display to a wider set of people. It only lasts when the community to be displayed to is also small and inward looking. And then my second example would be these beautiful sarcophagi, and I don't have a picture of it here, you know, Khonsu and Sinejim from Theban Tomb 1. Uh, you guys can Google it. <laughs> but um, they're bigger than this table, probably six feet tall, um, eight or nine feet in length meticulously painted, absolutely gorgeous. They're in the Cairo Museum now. We're found in the same um, tomb as this piece was found in and a number of other pieces that I've shown. And for these people, these are craftsmen. This woman was the wife of a craftsman who decorated the tombs in the Valley of the Kings. And the sarcophagi that I'm talking about, they're wooden rectangular objects into which you would place a nested inner outer coffin set with the mummy board. And the mummy, of course. And for these lower elites, having these big, huge sarcophagi to drag around in procession obviously got them a lot of play. It was something that was very useful to them. But you don't see, um, and they put more of their wealth in those outer pieces than they did in the inner pieces. And so maybe for them, making a splash to more people was more, was more useful because they're lower elites. But... But I still have, I have to think about this. I mean, it, it depends. I don't think there's one rule. It depends on where you fit in society um, and who you, whom you have to display and how many people they are and what social level. So it, it all depends. 
third example, and then I'll get to the question behind you. Um, a burial chamber. Sometimes very high elites decorated their burial chamber. Who got to go into a burial chamber? That's a place that's supposed to be capped and sealed and closed. Ostensibly, you only get to go into it when the first tomb owner is interred. And these are very small spaces. The accessible tomb chapel is up above where people can come and go. This is the burial chamber that's often down a deep shaft or a sloping passage, hard to get in and out of. And very few people can fit inside. If you're decorating your burial chamber, you only need to impress 12, 10 people. And so it's a, and burial chamber decoration is rare. People don't buy Maseratis and hide them in the garage, right? They buy expensive stuff and they show them to people. But they might buy something really, really special and only show it to 10 or 15 people in their home if it's something that will get them um, some sort of a social status marker or drink a $20,000 bottle of wine or whatever, you know, insanely rich people might do. Um, but I, I hope that kind of answers your question. It, it's a complicated one you just asked. You could write a book about what, what you just asked. Um, in, the, in the back, please. Um, you said earlier that women have had roles where they've saved by these people who were and men have taken the credit for it and properly. Do you feel like after all this has happened, all this time, and it's time for it to be there, do you feel like that like the reason that she's an actor is like it's more kind of like a, a, a subject to her and you save the science and you're a woman, but I'm going to, you know, you're going to ultimately be a man. You ultimately had that man role and you remembered as that man. No, I wouldn't put it that way. Um, let me start with, with this. The Egyptians, and I'll get to the point about power politics. Well, the part about power politics is the way that Egyptian culture worked vis-a-vis -vis femininity. A, being flexible, you could masculinize or feminize. And B, allowing females to have more power than other places in the ancient world. And C, having a totalitarian or authoritarian regime that needed to be upheld. All of those things allowed women into power more systematically and regularly than other parts of the world. That doesn't mean that there's not a pushback when it happens, but it happens more regularly in Egypt than anywhere on the planet in the ancient world that I've ever seen, which is weird and strange and amazing, and, and that's why I have more to say. But the cool thing, and it was Anne Macy Rock who pointed this out the first time, and she's an Egyptologist who's, who's in New York um, at NYU. She remarked how you have an earth god and not a mother, a earth, not an earth goddess, right? When you think of, you think, who's the goddess? What femininity is it? In Western culture, it's a female. It's the earth goddess, right? The Egyptians had an earth god. And then the sky in Western culture, you think of Zeus and thunderbolts and lightning and storms or Baal and some fierce weather god. But in the Egyptian understanding, it is a female. And the sun at his death goes below the Western horizon and is swallowed into her enveloped into her body and then moves through her to be born from her in the eastern horizon. And she is a canopy over the earth, but it is a feminine thing. The idea that I talked about that, that creation itself, and this is what drove the mother and child from the room, if none of you noticed. Um, right? Yeah. Because I mean, because I mean, yeah. So I knew it might happen. But so if creation is, is, is displayed in such a masculine, sexualizing way, you would think that this would take power from the female in social settings, but interestingly, it doesn't. If you look at the same text from Dero Medina, this arid place that I was talking about that preserves all of these texts, when women and men get divorced, there's often a discussion of the, for the reasons of, for the divorce. And they'll say, oh, the man is, the woman is dry, the man hasn't put semen inside of her. He is given the fault for the lack of a pregnancy, not the woman. In some ways, having the onus of creation hurts the woman. It's something to be controlled, something to be mastered, something to be veiled, something to be circumcised. And if you look at it the other way around, that it's the male that does the creating and the female is the protective vessel of it, in some ways you could say that translates into more social power for women rather than less. And then when they're buried as real women, either kings or not, as elite women, and they're buried... When they're buried as Osirian men, it's with the respect that they deserve the same transformation um, that a man gets. And, you know, it's not until, let's be really provocative, and, <laughs> but
because why not? <laughs> and, and say that the idea of a virgin birth is a very ancient Egyptian notion. The idea of a God creating himself is a very Egyptian notion. And so the, the enunciation, the idea that Mary's like, what, me? It's just, it's just here? <laughs> it's just here. She has nothing to do with it. She is just a vessel. And that God has impregnated his own manifestation of himself into her. That's, a, that's an extraordinarily Egyptian thing. Then in that context, and there I agree with you, it translates into a loss of power for the female, but it's in a confusing context. The virgin birth, as it's manifested in Christianity, occurs in a setting where females are given all of the onus and all of the weight of the creative potential. Because that paganism doesn't go away. All of those ideas of where creation comes from in the Western world, they stay. Then you inject the virgin birth into that, and then God help you. Then it's not good for the women. <laughs> what? One more? Oh, we get one more, you guys. One more. Um, uh-oh. Meeny, meeny, miny, mo. I saw her first. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yes. And Ed knows this well. There's all kinds of curses on tombs and all over the place. Don't hurt my coffin or a crocodile's going to snatch you or some horrible thing's going to happen to you. You see it all the time. Um, and so you would think, oh, that's interesting. Why, why are the Egyptians still reusing so much? And then my answer to that would be, having looked at what I've looked at and analyzed what I've analyzed, most reuse is happening legally in the context of the family. It's not, most of it is not tomb robbery. Most of it is happening in a very legit and in some ways sanctioned way. The, has anyone been paying attention to the discussions of King Tut in the last year? The mask of Tutankhamun is a reused mask. And I think that that was made very clear to me when I was in the Egyptian Museum last, standing right next to Nick Reeves, who showed me the, the reused cartouche and where the old cartouche was with the backing of Dieter Arnold and Mark the Bold. I mean, this is, not, this is legit stuff. That's a 26-pound solid gold mask of Tutankhamun that's reused. But it's reused in, in a legal context of the family. We don't know the circumstances of it. Did they snatch it from a dead body? We have no idea. Um, if you're snatching it from the dead body, but it's your family member, then there are ways of dealing with the, the problematic nature of that. And thus the crocodile or the snake or whatever it is that could, could potentially harm you in such a curse inscription wouldn't, wouldn't come after you. Um, the Egyptians thought about this, I'm sure, but they never wrote about it directly. The Egyptians, and Ed knows as well as an Egyptologist, the Egyptians don't even discuss the death of Osiris directly, right? It's always like the day that he fell under the tree, and you're like, wait, fell under a tree, I don't understand. But they're talking about his murder by his brother Seth, but they never talk about it directly. And this is the same with the Battle of Kadesh and Ramses II. Oh, it was a great battle, and I saved the day when really the empire was lost on that day and was never the same. So th this is not a... Th authoritarian regimes like to spin the truth, yes? Have we learned this? I think we have. Um, and the Egyptians as a people like to um, spin this, this reuse, but also I think since most of it was happening in a legal context, it, it doesn't have the same meaning. And you know why I can say it was happening in a legal context? Because there's so much, and this kind of comes full circle, it will be a perfect stopping place before we go on our little tour, is there were so much gender modification. So, so many coffins that were changed from male to female, and then from female to male. A female coffin has flat hands, a male has fisted hands, because the female's passive, the male is active, right? Female's got a wig and earrings and breasts. Male doesn't have these things. He's just got the ear lobes or a full ear and a striped headdress. And you see these things switching back and forth. You see a female coffin made into a male, a male coffin made into a female. Extremely expensive, time-consuming, clunky, where I can see the old stripes underneath the female wig, and I can see where they pulled off the earring and just painted over it roughly. And why would they do that if they could just go to the black market or the market 
and buy a coffin for a female because that's what they need. Or in their limited and scarce context of the family, they've got one coffin set, and the female's the one who's died. And they're like, oh, crap. We've got to make it into a man's coffin and switch it. And then also, we can't, keep, we can't lose sight that the coffins that I'm looking at are the last instance of reuse. And I can't, some coffins I have been able to prove four instances of reuse on one coffin. That's the most I've been able to go back, in a sense. But, you know, when you're removing wood and removing pigment, there's only so much I can say for um, the number of instances of reuse. I think it's much higher than any of us can possibly imagine. So, so I, I would like to thank all of you for coming and thank you very much.